Racing the Great Bear Ni Onunji Hear my story which happened long ago. For many generations, the five nations of the Haudenosaunee, the people of the Longhouse, had been at war with one another. No one could say how the wars began, but each time a man of one nation was killed, his relatives sought revenge in the blood feud, and so the fighting continued. Then the Creator took pity on his people and sent a message of peace. The peacemaker traveled from nation to nation, convincing the people of the five nations, the Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, and the Seneca, that it was wrong for brothers to kill one another. It was not easy, but finally the nations agreed and the great peace began. Most welcomed that peace, though there were some be some beings with bad hearts who wished to see the return of war. One day, not long after the great peace had been established, some young men in the Seneca village decided they would pay a visit to the Onondaga people. It is safe now to walk the trail between our nations, the young men said. We will return after the sun has risen and set seven times. Then they set out. They walked toward the east until they were lost from sight in the hills. But many more than seven days passed, and those young men never returned. Now another group of young men left, wanting to find out where their friends had gone. They too did not return. The people grew worried. Parties were sent out to look for the vanished young men, but no sign was found and the searchers who went too far into the hills did not return either. The old chief of the village thought long and hard. He asked the clan mothers, those wise women whose job it was to choose the chiefs and give them good advice, what should be done. We must find someone brave enough to face whatever danger is out there, the clan mother said. So the old chief called the whole village to the council meeting. He held up a white strand of wampum beads made from quahog clamshells as he spoke. Hear me, he said. I am of two minds about what has happened to our people. It may be that the Onondaga have broken the peace and captured them. It may be there is something with an evil mind that wishes to destroy this new peace and so has killed our people. Now someone must go and find out. Who is brave enough? Who will come and take this wampum from my hand? Many men were gathered in that council. Some were known to speak of themselves as brave warriors. Still, though they muttered to one another, no man stepped forward to take the strand of wampum. The old chief began to walk about the circle, holding the wampum in front of each man in turn. But each man only lowered his eyes to the ground. No man lifted his hand to take the wampum. Just outside the circle stood a boy who had not yet become a man. His parents were dead, and he lived with his grandmother in her old lodge at the end of the village. His clothing was always torn and his face dirty because his grandmother was too old to care for him as a mother would. The other young men made fun of him, and as a joke, they called him Swift Runner, even though no one had ever seen him run, and it was thought that he was weak and lazy. All he ever seemed to do was play with his little dog, or sit by the fire and listen when the old people were talking. "'Our chief has forgotten our greatest warrior,' one of the young men said to another, tilting his head toward Swift Runner. "Oi," the other young man said, laughing. "'Yes. Why does he not offer the wampum to Swift Runner?' chief looked around the circle of men, and the laughing stopped. He walked out of the circle to the place where the small boy in torn clothes stood. He held out the wampum, and Swift Runner took it without hesitating. I accept this, Swift Runner said. It is right that I be the one to face the danger. In the eyes of the people, I am worthless, so if I do not return, it will not matter. I will leave when the sun rises tomorrow. When Swift Runner arrived home at his grandmother's lodge, the old woman was waiting for him. Grandson, she said, I know what you have done. The people of this village no longer remember, but your father was a great warrior. Our family is a family that has power. Then she reached up into the rafters and took down a heavy bow. It was blackened with smoke and seemed so thick that no man could bend it. If you can string this bow, grandson, the old woman said, you are ready to face whatever waits for you on the trail. Swift Runner took the bow. It was as thick as a man's wrist, but he bent it with ease and strung it. Waha! said his grandmother. You are the one I knew you would grow up to be. Now you must sleep. At dawn we will make you ready for journey. It was not easy for Swift Runner to sleep, but when he woke the next morning, he felt strong and clear-headed. His grandmother was sitting by the fire with a cap in her hand. This was your grandfather's cap, she said. I have sewed four hummingbird feathers on it. It will make your feet more swift. Swift Runner took the cap and placed it on his head. 
His grandmother held up four pairs of moccasins. Carry these tied to your waist. When one pair wears out, throw them aside and put on the next pair. Swift Runner took the moccasins and tied them to his belt. Next, his grandmother picked up a small pouch. In this pouch is cornmeal mixed with maple sugar, she said. It is the only food you will need as you travel. It will give you strength when you eat it each evening. Swift Runner took the pouch and hung it from his belt by the moccasins. The last thing I must give you, said the old woman, is this advice. Pay close attention to your little dog. You have treated him well, and so he is your great friend. He is small, but his eyes and nose are keen. Keep him always in front of you. He will warn you of danger before it can strike you. Then Swift Runner set out on his journey. His little dog stayed ahead of him, sniffing the air and sniffing the ground. By the time the sun was in the middle of the sky, they were far from the village. The trail passed through deep woods, and it seemed to the boy as if something was following them among the trees. But he could see nothing in the thick brush. The trail curved toward the left, and the boy felt even more pre the presence of something watching. Suddenly his little dog ran into the bush at the side of the trail, barking loudly. There were sounds of tree limbs breaking and heavy feet running. Then, out of the forest, came Niagwehi, a monster bear. Its great teeth were as long as a man's arm. It was twice as tall as a moose. Close at its heels was Swift Runner's little dog. I see you, Swift Runner shouted. I am after you. You cannot escape me. Swift Runner had learned those words by listening to the stories the old people told. They were the very words a monster bear speaks when it attacks, words that terrify anyone who hears them. On hearing those words, the great bear turned and fled from the boy. You cannot escape me, Swift Runner shouted again. Then he ran after the bear. The Neogui turned toward the east. With Swift Runner and his dog close behind, it left the trail and plowed through the thick forest, breaking down great trees and leaving a path of destruction like that of a whirlwind. It ran up the tallest hills and down through the swamps, but the boy and the dog stayed at its heels. They ran past a great cave in the rocks. All around the cave were the bones of people the bear had caught and eaten. My relatives, Swift Runner called as he passed the ca cave, will not forget you. I am after the one who killed you. He will not escape me. Throughout the day, the boy and his dog chased the great bear, growing closer bit by bit. At last, as the sun began to set, Swift Runner stopped at the head of a small valley and called his small dog to him. We will rest here for the night, the boy said. He took off his first pair of moccasins, whose soles were worn away to nothing. He threw them aside and put on a new pair. Swift Runner made a fire and sat beside it with his dog. Then he took out the pouch of cornmeal and maple sugar, sharing his food with his dog. Nothing will harm us, Swift Runner said. Nothing can come close to our fire. He lay down and slept. In the middle of the night, he was awakened by the growling of his dog. He sat up with his back to the fire and looked into the darkness. There, just outside the circle of light made by the flames, stood a dark figure that looked like a tall man. His eyes glowed green. I am Niagwehi, he said, said the figure. This is my human shape. Why do you... You cannot escape me, Swift Runner said. I chase you because you killed my people. I will not stop until I catch you and kill you. The figure faded back into the darkness. You cannot escape me, Swift Runner said again. Then he patted his small dog and went to sleep. As soon as the first light of the day, new day appeared, Swift Runner rose. He and his small dog took the trail. It was easy to follow the monster's path, for trees were uprooted and the earth torn by its great bear running toward the east. Swift Runner pulled off his second pair of moccasins, whose soles were worn away to nothing. He put on his third pair and began to run again. All through that day, they kept the neo in sight, drawing closer bit by bit. When the sun began to set, Swift Runner stopped to make camp. He took off the third pair of moccasins, whose soles were worn away to nothing, and put on the last pair. Tomorrow, he said to a small dog, we will catch the monster and kill it. He reached for his pouch of cornmeal maple sugar, but when he opened it, he found it filled with worms. The magic of the Niagwehi had done this. Swift Runner poured out the pouch and slid in aloud and said in a loud voice, You have spoiled our food, but it will not stop me. I am on your trail. You cannot escape me. That night, once again, he was awakened by the growling of his dog. A dark figure stood just outside the circle of light. It looked smaller than the night before, and the glow of his eyes was weak. 
I am Niagwahi, the dark figure said. Why do you pursue me? You cannot escape me, Swift Runner said. I am on your trail. You killed my people. You threatened the great peace. I will not rest until I catch you. Hear me, said the Niagwahi. I see your power is greater than mine. Do not kill me. When you catch me, take my great teeth. They are my power, and you can use them for healing. Spare my life, and I will go far to the north and never again bother the people of the longhouse. You cannot escape me, Swift Runner said. I am on your trail. The dark figure faded back into the darkness, and Swift Runner sat for a long time looking into the night. At the first light of day, the boy and his dog took the trail. They had not gone far when they saw Niagwehi ahead of them. Its sides puffed in and out as it ran. The trail was beside a big lake with many alder trees close to the water. As the great bear ran past, the leaves were torn from the trees. Fast as the bear went, the boy and his dog came closer, bit by bit. At last, when the sun was in the middle of the sky, the giant bear could no longer run. It felt heavily to the earth, panting so hard that it stirred up clouds of dust. Swift Runner unslung his grandfather's bow and notched the arrow to the sinewy string. "'Shoot for my heart!' said the Niagwahi. "'Aim well. If you cannot kill me with one arrow, I will take your life.' "'No,' Swift Runner said. "'I have listened to the stories of my elders. Your only weak spot is the sole of your foot. Hold up your foot, and I will kill you.' The great bear shook with fear. You have defeated me, it pleaded. Spare my life, and I will leave you forever. You must give me your great teeth, Swift Runner said. Then you must leave and never bother the people of the longhouse again. I shall do as you s do as you say, Niagwahi. Take my teeth. Take my great teeth. Swift Runner lowered his bow. He stepped forward and pulled out the great bear's teeth. It rose to its feet and walked to the north, growing smaller as it went. It went over the hill and was gone. Carrying the teeth of Niagwahi over his shoulder, Swift Runner turned back to the west, his dog at his side. He walked for three moons before he reached the place where the bones of his people were piled in front of the monster's empty cave. He collected those bones and walked around them four times. Now, he said, I must do something to make my people wake up. He went to a big hickory tree and began to push it over so it would fall on the pile of bones. My people, he shouted, get up quickly or this tree will land on you. The bones of the people who had been killed all came together and jumped up, alive again and covered with flesh. They were filled with joy and gathered around Swift Runner. Great one, they say. Who are you? I am Swift Runner, he said. How can that be? One of the men said. Swift Runner is a skinny little boy. You are a tall, strong man. Swift Runner looked at himself and saw that it was so. He was taller than the tallest man, and his little dog was bigger than a wolf. I am Swift Runner, he said. I was that boy, and I am the man you see before you. Niagwahi and those who saw what he had carried rejoiced. He carried him with the teeth of the Niagwahi, and those who saw what he carried rejoiced. The trails were safe again, and the great peace would not be broken. Swift Runner went to his grandmother's lodge and embraced her. Grandson, she said. You are now the man I knew you could grow up to be. Remember to use your power to help the people. So it was that Swift Runner ran with the great bear and won the race. Throughout his long life, he used the teeth of Niagwahi to heal the sick, and he worked always to keep the great peace. Daniho, I am finished. <laughs>